Well, welcome to the ebook learning systems, latest developments and what to look for. In this session, you will develop an understanding of the state of ebooks globally, including the latest innovations, and you will discover what the future may hold for ebooks. In addition, you will find out what to look for when choosing an ebook library system for your school and learn how ePlatform has responded to and innovated for school library needs. I'm Karen Bonanno from EduWebinar and I will be your host and facilitator for this broadcast. It is with pleasure that I uh, introduce our guest uh, for this broadcast, Patricia Jennett, and she is the Director of ALS Library Services. Patricia has 15 years management experience within the Australian and New Zealand book industry, including publishing, distribution, online services and printing. She runs ALS services uh, with an eye on the future for the, what the industry is uh, doing and she is a commercial partner with the platform. Also too in the background I have uh, Andy Ward who is the ePlatform technical support person. So if you have any questions that you key in you might find that Andy is going to respond to those. Hello to everybody. My name is Patricia Jennett and um, you'll know me as Trish and I'm very pleased to be here. Today we're going to look at a number of things that you can see on your screen in front of you. We're going to look at the current state of ebooks globally including some innovations. We're going to look at what the future might hold for some ebooks. Look at choosing an ebook library system for your school or organisation, and also about ePlatform. I'm going to look at some um, also some frustrations that uh, we have in the ebook lending or e-lending in arena, and I think that's pretty important as well because it's not all rosy. I wanted to take you uh, back to 2012. For those of you who've been around in your libraries during that period of time, you might remember that in 2012 there was very little in terms of e-books uh, in the marketplace. My background is uh, in education. I started my life as a teacher librarian. I went on to work at Deakin University. Then I worked for Scholastic, a large educational publisher. Australian Council for Educational Research, and then very happily now own ALS Library Services. So I've had a good background in books and education. And in 2012, I was at a publisher party at the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I met up with Paul G. Temple, who's director of Wheelers. And I was talking to him about the fact that I wished I had a million dollars tucked into my back pocket because e-books and e-lending were going to be the future and my libraries and my client libraries were really asking to have a look at uh, what was possible. And when we sat down and spoke with publishers, that was also happening. Unfortunately, I don't have a million dollars tucked into my back pocket, but Paul did. And he invested very heavily and created the ePlatform website, which is one that we're going to be looking at later today. You know as well as I do that between 2012 and 2015 lots of things have changed. So the state of the market at the moment is that ebook sales growth has flattened. We're looking at around 10% up on the previous year. Some markets are nearly 15 to 20%. Some genres are continuing to grow, cookbooks, children's books and romance. And others have been very stable. If you look at romance as being a subset of fiction, there's generally some increases. If you look at uh, fiction on its own, it's very stable. In 2013-14, publishers were very nervous about this state of the market. The growth at that stage was more like a hockey stick than a flattened process. And many publishers were looking at the possibility of enormous warehouses full of print books with not being able to sell those to the level that they wanted to. And e-books were considered to be just something that was playing on the edges and not really something that was moving forward. There have been some changes though. One of the good changes has been an enormous rise in non-fiction. For those of you in school libraries, some of that has been in the textbook section, uh, others just in the general non-fiction. But ebook aggregator ePub Direct actually says that things like cookbooks, biographies, general nonfiction is amongst, as you can see there, 56% of the top 300 titles sold each year. 
So that's actually been something that's a new development and in terms of publisher input, something that they're very happy with. And as you can also see, the kids are all right. 93% of US children aged 2 to 13 e-read at least once a week, so they say. That's a study that uh, we've been able to access. I'm not sure that the numbers are identical in Australia and I'd be very interested down the track if you've got some even anecdotal numbers from your own experience, either in your own households or um, in the schools that you teach. One of the reasons why that hockey stick of growth stabilised um, was actually the second dot point here, that we now see ebooks as being complementary to print rather than challenging it. Lots more publishers are releasing ebook versions of print titles. Increasingly we're seeing that digital resources as integral to libraries as an information centre and that's where the non-fiction component comes in. And of course there's the eternal avoiding cover shame process. That's the growth of romance fueled by helping readers get racy fiction fiction, uh, fixes sorry, without being too obvious about that. I wish I could actually look out over the people that I'm speaking to and ask you to put your hand up if you're one of those people who has a racy fiction fix. Um, maybe you've downloaded a book from Sourcebooks or one of the Black Lace ones, just because it's interesting to have it on your um, iPad or tablet or your iPhone. Because I think that there's uh, quite a comment there about what's happening in terms of us being able to transfer those books from one section to another. Another part of the market that has changed um, is also uh, has created some challenges for us. And one of the biggest challenges, and I'm just going to leave that blank screen there for a minute while I speak to you about it, one of the biggest challenges we face is actually publishers. As I mentioned earlier, publishers are very nervous about the rise of what we call trade ebooks, um, those that are being sold through Apple, Amazon, and any of the Android um, websites. Those titles are often told sold at less than print prices, so they're selling if it if a print title is available in the Australian or American marketplace for $17.95 or $19.95. The e-book is usually the equivalent of $7.95 or $9.95, so considerably less. Some of you will be saying, well, yes, that's okay because there's obviously a lot less to do. You don't have to store a physical book. You don't have to create a physical book. You don't have to put a barcode on it. You don't have to actually handle it in any way. However, most publishers will tell you, and they are being quite truthful, the majority of the costs that go into producing a book are actually the ones that are about developing the book, working with the author, making sure it's edited appropriately, getting a good cover image, um, ensuring that the chapters are the correct length, and then the big expense in terms of marketing that title out to the community. More and more publishers are looking at using their own websites as marketing and tools, and we're going to see much more of that, I think, as we look at business to consumer marketing in the book industry. Some of you might have some interesting stories about how that's happened, especially in the textbook market. And um, again, I'd love to hear those when we break in a few minutes. I'm going to give you just a cartoon to look at for a minute. And while I'm doing that, I want you to think um, about some of the challenges that you might have within your classrooms and um, within your organisations in terms of getting e-books and e-lending as a part of the natural culture, not being seen as being negative towards um, a literacy profile for a school or an educational institute. One of the questions that's just popped up has talked specifically about Penguin Random House. Now, we're going obviously someone's picked up my comment about publishers. Yes, you're absolutely right. Penguin Random House is the biggest publisher in um, the world at the moment, and they still do not have e-lending rights for almost all of their trade collection. 
Some of the Pearson titles, some of the education titles are available on various websites. Some of the e-lenders have some backlist from Penguin, nothing from Random House. So at the moment, if you do an exercise like we did recently in-house here where we looked at all the Premier's reading challenge lists in each of the states and tried to make a connection between the print titles and those that are available in e-format, the very big issue that came up was that there were no Penguin Random House titles available in e-lending format. So for schools looking to replicate something like the Premier's Reading Challenge for their digital environment as well as for the print environment, that cannot happen because those books aren't available. All I can say is that um, myself uh, and Paul and I'm quite sure every other major supplier of um, e-platforms and e-lending platforms to the library industry are in consultation with Penguin and Random House. We believe that we're very close to getting them to agree to make their titles available for e-lending. I would like to think that before Christmas comes around this year, I will get an early Christmas present and be able to tell our customers that Penguin Random House is available for you all tomorrow. But I'm not sure about that. Some of the other challenges that we've got. Uh, textbooks, graphic novels and some illustrated books are quite difficult to convert um, because of the large file size. Some of the devices um, that we have accessible to read those um, can cause a problem. Sometimes external software is needed to read ebooks, Blue Fire Readers. Hand up those of you who hate Blue Fire Reader or those of you that love it. Different file formats can display ebooks badly, fixed layouts for instance. Those of you who have got a technical background will know that EPUB 3 and now even talking about EPUB 4, so that's the software that actually creates the EPUB versions of our ebooks, is um, now almost standard across all publishers. EPUB 3 provides for some interactivity, EPUB 4 provides for an enormous amount of interactivity. If we just go back a little minute to 2012, that very first time we were in Frankfurt talking to publishers about getting their ebooks on board, the costs were huge. We talked to a, a general British publisher, perhaps someone with a, a nice romance title that we wanted to get on, and they'd be saying to us, it's going to cost us you know, something like 400, somewhere between 400 and 1,000 pounds to convert this text book, text-based book into um, EPUB, even into simple PDF. A year later, at Frankfurt 2013, that had completely gone away. The IT had caught up very quickly with eBooks and the cost to actually convert um, and good EPUB conversion was down to £40, certainly less than £100 for a text-based book obviously a little bit higher for different file formats. So those things, that's really what actually sponsored and kicked off that hockey stick of sales because suddenly publishers could afford for even their backlist titles to convert them. Just continuing with the list of challenges you've got in front of you, limitations of the internet. Uh, some of you may be in areas where um, Broadband is not available as easily as it could be or we have some bandwidth issues. Um, and obviously, as we just discussed, publishers are still not convinced of e-lending models. Now, I have another question that's just popped up onto my screen um, and that's a question about picture storybooks. And yes, picture storybooks do fit into the challenges section. As I mentioned to you, picture storybooks um, can often take uh, quite a lot of um, bandwidth to download because of the intricacies of the pictures and it doesn't need to be just picture storybooks for children but I'm also including in that things like um, illustrated books for uh, what we would call a coffee table book. Sometimes publishers play it safe and use a PDF method which means that it's absolutely fixed format, nothing will move when you open the title but it is a flatter file 
and although it'll download quickly, it doesn't look quite as good as an EPUB file will. So yes, um, we don't have a, a real solution for picture storybooks at this stage. What you'll find for most uh, library suppliers and um, ebook suppliers is that you can often choose either the PDF version or the EPUB version when you're looking at illustrated titles. So it's entirely up to you whether you want to um, have the extra bandwidth involved in taking down an EPUB version of an illustrated title or whether you want to have the slightly easier option of taking down a fixed format PDF book. Um, so that is um, open to you as a customer. All right, now, innovations. There is a lot going on in the ebook world and I'm just going to touch on a few of them. We talked earlier about Bluefire Reader as being one of the options uh, of a reader that you could actually download and um, read your ebook in. Of course, uh, Wheelers, like all the other ebook providers, have their own reading app now. So you can take an app, uh, they're free um, to download, they don't take very much time. And the screen that you see in front of you shows you the sorts of settings that you should be able to do um, in any good reading app. So you've got settings uh, regarding fonts, and there's a broad range there. Obviously I can't scroll down on that screen, but you can see there's plenty of them. You've got settings for uh, columns and colours and recommendations. The screen on the right hand side is a night screen, so you can see that um, you've got two versions there, um, sorry, two columns there um, of a night screen, so it's slightly darker. And we've got the ability also to um, not only increase the font size, but also to increase the letter spacing so that you can see very clearly what you're reading. So that's one of the innovations uh, that's available now for um, ebook readers. It's really no excuse for everybody not being able to handle those. All the apps that are downloadable can be used on all the platforms, so Android and iOS, and uh, for ePlatform in particular, the Windows 8 will be available very soon because that's starting to develop quite a market of its own. Some of the other um, innovations, one of the ones that's actually quite dear to my heart because at heart I'm a marketer, is the cross-marketing or bundling of E and P books. And um, in fact, I've just had a question pop up on my screen um, regarding the download times and whether or not that's going to, has anybody has, uh, the question actually says, has anybody else had any problems with download times um, for large books? And I think because we've just had a slide with Game of Thrones on it, they're actually referring to the Game of Thrones times, which as we know are 800 pages plus. Um, I think the simple answer there is no. Uh, for a text-based book like Game of Thrones, it should be able to be downloaded very quickly. And most of the apps that are available now, certainly the ePlatform app, has very large cache um, con context so that you can actually cache that book on your device, either on your iPad or your tablet or your phone. And because they're syncing across all those devices, you can start reading it um, on your screen at home or in the library. You can take it on your iPad on the bus on the way home and pick it up in the supermarket queue on your iPhone and it will all sync across. So there won't be any problem about that process. So that's the answer to that question. Um, again, just to remind you, for illustrated titles, there may be a little bit more involved in actually downloading those. All right, back to cross-marketing. Uh, cross-marketing and bundling of E&P books has been used with a number of textbook suppliers or educational suppliers. They like the concept of you purchasing a print book and having access to an e-book, or they like the concept of getting a little bit more money from you as a customer to purchase both formats, and they are just two different formats of exactly the same thing. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I know as an avid reader myself, I read a lot in E, and if I like the book a lot, I tend to then want to go out and buy it in P because I want to put it on my bookshelf. I do have a bookshelf, a digital bookshelf of books, but pretty much all of them that I really, really like are in print so that I can actually put them on my physical bookshelf. 
And I don't think that's about people coming in to have dinner with me and seeing what books are on my shelf. It's more about me being able to stand there and have that terrific feeling that those have become part of me and that the books that I've read change me and make me who I am. The cross-marketing I'm referring to is not so much the bundling though, but the fact that publishers now have the ability to hook you into a title or a series by very quickly creating a new digital file. So we're talking to publishers at the moment and saying to them, if you've got an amazing series like, well, Hunger Games, Divergent, let's talk about the YA market for a minute. When you get to the end of series, uh, the end of the first book, the second book's usually on its way to being written, but isn't available yet. But within 12 months or so, that second book will be very close to being available on the marketplace. And what publishers are looking at doing, they haven't, nobody's actually done it yet, but I think that it's going to be coming, is they're looking at then creating a new book in the marketplace, which is kind of a crossover. So it'll be book one, and it'll have the first couple of chapters of book two in it, and it will actually replace the book one that you've got sitting in your collection. What we're hoping that publishers will do is upload the new title or the new edition, if you like, to um, things like ePlatform and that we'll be able to download them to you and get that process of cross-marketing up and running with readers. I think there's going to be some issues with ISBNs, um, but I'm sure that they'll work through that process as they come to it. The other area of cross-marketing is whether or not there's going to be um, the ability for you to actually move from one digital book straight into another digital book through some intermediary process. And publishers would love the idea of if you finish that title at midnight of book one and book two is already available, that you immediately get sent to through to a link where you can either download that book from a library if it's available or purchase it from a commercial site. All right, some other um, innovations that we've um, had a look at and that are making it much easier for patrons. There's uh, easy returns of increased title turnover in libraries. In 2013 and 14, when we were just starting to implement large numbers of titles into public and school libraries, it was a much harder process to convince libraries to actually get the titles turned over. Borrowing times tended to be the same borrowing times that they were for hardcover books or for print books, uh, so two to three weeks. But of course you don't need to come back into the library to return an e-book. So easy returns mean increased title turnover for your collection and every e-platform or e-lending provider should make that a priority and they are certainly starting to do so. We've obviously got the ability to look up definitions, use Google links. We can encourage reluctant readers with a little bit of tags at the end, pictures that move. EPUB 3 has got that interactivity built into it. You can add your own notes into your reading copy. And of course what we're doing here is replicating but improving just a little bit on traditional print books. One of the other innovations that um, we can look at is uh, layout and design specifically for the ebook format. As I mentioned to you before, EPUB 3 format has embedded multimedia, which can be video or audio. I don't think, unless you've got a Foxtel um, subscription, that you're going to be able to click on a Game of Thrones book and actually get the movie coming up. In fact, you probably don't want to do that for some age groups. But it is a concept that could be available in the not too distant future. And of course there's the nighttime reading model as well, which we've got in front of us here. Let me move on to the future. And again, let me encourage you to send in your questions. We've had a few so far, which has been terrific, but um, I'm really open to answering any questions that you might have. You might have some very specific ones. If you want to type your question in, um, it's just for you to see and for us to see at this stage. And if it's a generic answer, we'll send it out to everybody. If it's something that you just want answered to for yourself, 
then we can actually get in contact with you later. So what do we need to know about the future? There's a lot, couple of things that are going to be coming. We talked briefly about the fact that there is going to be much more content rich books. Will we still use the word books? I think we will. But the content within those books will be broadened. As the cost of production falls um, and as e-readers ourselves we become more used to the format, we'll actually become a little bit more comfortable with that process. I know when I first um, encountered e-books where there was uh, rich content embedded within the book, I found it a little bit distracting. If I'm reading a book, the latest Fiona Macintosh set in a lovely forest, I don't really want to hear the birds twittering in the background and the whoosh of the wind through the trees. Maybe I do, I'm not sure. I don't think I do. But that definitely is a possibility of making that happen. So there's going to be a lot greater engagement and um, dynamism uh, in the concept and the format of those books that they're created. And especially for children's books, I think, uh, hopefully the high quality and design and colour features for children's books won't be negated by too much interaction. But as always, common sense has to prevail and you as librarians have to make that decision. There's nothing to say that an e-book uh, is going to, it shouldn't have exactly the same kind of structure and decision making process built around it as you do for your print collection. So when you choose a book, is it published by a good author? Is it a good publisher? Is the design appropriate for the age? Is the text appropriate for the age? Is it a good cover so that it's easy and connects with people as they look at it? All those sorts of things help you to um, maintain a collection and you use exactly the same details and specific details about picking a title for your collection. The other thing that's going to probably happen in the future is that there will be um, power to the people. As publishers and authors, we can create multimedia ebooks through easy apps that are available. iBooks Author, Adobe InDesign are only two of lots and lots of them. I'm quite sure that for those of you in the school systems, you've already encountered quite a number of these from very basic to very complex um, I, digital development and multimedia processes to create your own ebooks. Although I'm basically a bookseller uh, and involved in library world, I do have another hat that I wear and I'm a small publisher as well. And one of the reasons I entered into the publishing world was because I, I had a good book that I thought would sell, that would be great. I didn't write it, somebody else did. But I was willing to put my money where my mouth was and get the book out for them. But the other reason was I was just very curious, and this was about two years ago, about the process of getting books not only into the print format but also into digital format. So I've been through all that process of turning a book from a print title through the process of um, using external providers as well as um, digital development companies to produce an e-book which has sold across all the platforms. So it's not difficult at all and it's not all that expensive. And the downside of that is that that means that some really bad books get published. But the upside is that some really good books that may not go through um, the normal process, especially when publishers are very tight in their um, ability to actually add new authors to their lists, will get published because they can do it themselves. All right, I've just had a question pop up on the screen about sharing. So the answer um, is, the very simple answer is yes. The question says, if I want to um, connect with two or three schools in my local area and share a collection, can I do that? Yes, you can. That consortium idea is something that um, works very well. And I'm just, you've jumped, you've jumped to the next slide, so I'll, I'll, answer, I'll go down to step two, the consortium setup. 
at um, ePlatform and also at all the other platforms um, for ebook lending, you can actually have a consortium. Uh, there's a number of ways of setting that up. If you've got a council or a board that wants to very strictly control the collection and the funds, then you may want to still actually have your own collection of library books, but make them accessible to other libraries for a fee. If you've got a council which is happier to share funds as well as the collection, what schools mainly do is decide amongst themselves what portion of their funding they can actually pool. Let's say you've got $5,000 to spend in a year, you might say $2,500 of that will go into the shared fund. Four other schools are going to do the same amount, so we get a nice little pile of money there to spend, about 10 grand, which means that all our collections can be increased. But you might like to keep the other 2500 up your sleeve to purchase titles that were going to be specific to your school, your library, your patrons and your demographics. You can choose still to share them within a consortium, so other libraries could still use them if you wanted to be magnanimous about that, but you could also choose not to share them so that they would only be available to your individual students or patrons as they log in. Um, if I'm a patron or if I'm a student at a school which has a consortium set up, as I log in um, to have a look at the collection, it's seamless. All I see is all the books that are available for me to borrow. I don't really care where they come from. I don't care if it's a scholastic book or um, a book from Walker or a book from a very tiny publisher that's just created a beautiful new title. All I know is I want that book because I like the cover or because my friend said it was a good read. So that's the one that I want to borrow. So that's I think, answers the consortium question. I think if you are an existing Wheelers ePlatform customer, there is no or very brief additional costs, but I'm not the right person to answer that question, so we'll move on from that. The other point here on the future slide talks about times with other media. For those of you who got hooked into watching Broadchurch, you'll probably know that in Series 2 um, a short story relating exactly to one of the characters was released just after that particular episode um, was released in the UK. So it was content for favourite TV series, for movies, anything that actually adds to the content. Publishers are more and more seeing themselves as media providers and content providers. So if they can make the connection to other media, they're more than happy to do so. Some other bits that are going to be happening in the future, there's lots of new markets being developed. Um, there are lots of different languages available. I was uh, made a presentation to the Singapore Public Library just a few months ago. They're predominantly purchasing titles in English language, but of course they're looking um, for Chinese, Malay, Tagalog, anywhere because Singapore is such a multicultural country as well. They have students from all around the world wanting to access those. And um, whereas a couple of years ago I would have said that was actually quite difficult, it's now much easier. I often get asked about whether or not libraries can add their own content to an ebook platform, and the answer is yes, of course. So if you've got those um, digital uh, devices or um, if you've got those digital um, concepts that are part of the curriculum and children are creating their own books, you might like to load them up into your own platform so that others can borrow. You can go to the expense of purchasing an ISBN and actually making it an official title, downloading the CIP data if you need to or the SCIS data. Or you can just make it something that's internally used and um, put the details in, in terms of title and author. The other future concept we talked briefly about is um, definitely that we're going to be building readers using mobile devices. I have absolutely no doubt that um, in families these days mobile devices are part of normal life and therefore they should be part of reading life as well and uh, whether or not you're reading it on your iPhone, your iPad, your tablet, your computer screen. As long as it's being shared and literacy is involved, 
then I think it's a good thing. And cross-format reading um, falls into that same category as well. We're almost at the end of the section. Again, I'm encouraging you to send any questions through that you might have. And I've got a couple on the screen which I'll answer while we um, look at uh, the next stage. One of the questions um, is in regards to privacy. Uh, this person has said, um, when you talked about consortiums, are we sharing data about our students as well as the books? And the answer is no, not unless you want to. Um, at ePlatform we take privacy very seriously, as should everybody, and um, the information that is stored in the ePlatform itself is really only the password and username of that particular user. As a as a administrator of ePlatform, you as the librarian can see exactly who's borrowed books, which books they've borrowed, what kind of books they've borrowed, how long they've had them for, all that sort of reporting can happen. But from an ePlatform perspective, we don't get any of that. So privacy is maintained very securely. Some schools I know, especially um, smaller ones, may um, not have a particular password environment uh, for their students to access ebooks um, or the digital content. If that's not the case, if that is the case, sorry, and you haven't set that process up, maybe developing something like ePlatform is a good way to do that. It's not very difficult to make sure that a card is issued to the um, each individual student with either their student number on it or a number as long as it can be linked to that particular student. They can obviously choose their own passwords and contact details if they need to. That's entirely um, in your remit. So ePlatform doesn't get involved in any of that and neither should any other platform. So just to recap, because I think I might have rambled there a wee bit, but privacy is an important issue and none of the patrons that are involved with borrowing things from any of the platforms, and particularly from ePlatform, but I can speak clearly about that, none of that information is um, either stored or shared, um, but you as administrator of the platform obviously have all that information. All right, we're just going to have a quick look then as we come to the end of our process about choosing an ebook system. It's not rocket science. Um, Obviously, you've got a budget that you need to work to, so point two, pricing. There are different models which offer different initial setup costs, annual fees, hosting, etc. Um, I know at ePlatform we have a bit of a mantra that we're all about the books and not about the IT, um, even though that's of course what's driving it. So we want um, schools and libraries to have as broad a collection as possible. We keep our initial setup costs uh, very low and um, for ePlatform in particular there are very few, if at all, annual fees for hosting. Accessibility is important, um, especially those of you with BYOD schools where you've got a number of different devices, you want to be able to make sure that apps are available across all those devices and that um, the syncing across those devices is very easy. And also, as we had a quick look at earlier, I think the ability to adjust the screen to make sure that it works for people with different levels of reading skill and maybe even with different physical and even attitudinal requirements. Someone who's finding it difficult to read on screen may need a little bit of help in that. Content. Um, <laughs> I predict that in about five years' time, maybe even less, maybe in three years' time, every provider of e-books for e-lending will have exactly the same range, almost like your print provider does now. And what you'll be looking at when you choose an e-book provider will be somebody who knows you, knows your school or your library well, understands your demographic, understands what you want from a standing order, and from a collection. At the moment, the content is ranged. 
Uh, some publishers have done some deals with some e-book providers, not all. Um, in general, the big five publishers, bar Penguin Random House, are all generally available on all the bigger platforms. For e-platform and for Wheelers and for ALS, because we are print providers as well in our local markets in Australia and New Zealand and in the UK, we're very aware of finding those tiny and mid-sized publishers that produce some very, very good books that are specific uh, to our readers. So because we're seeing the print books come through the warehouses, we're also grabbing those and making sure that um, those publishers, even if they're pretty much a garage publisher, if they're producing a book in ebook format, we're going to add it to the range. Um, integration. Is it adaptable with your school networks? Only you know, and I'll leave the IT guys to handle that. Um, Andy is available. If you've got a specific um, IT question, feel free to ask him. Um, I'm not the right person to answer that, but I know that he's listening carefully. And of course, selection. I do a lot of workshops around the country with, uh, I have to say, mainly public libraries, um, less so with school libraries. But I'm finding that um, the question that I most get asked is, please help me find the right titles. I just don't have time to sort through the hundreds and thousands of titles that I know are being loaded regularly onto platforms. Part of the problem is that as um, publishers finally decide that they're going to come on board, and um, Simon & Schuster is a classic example, quite recently said, yep, we're ready to go. Here's 6,000 titles that we can load up immediately. And it's like, oh my goodness, 6,000 wonderful titles, well, maybe 5,000, but way too many for an average um, library manager to actually sort through and pick out. So what we do is that um, if we have a very large publisher that comes on board like that, we create very quickly lists of the best of. So the best of the children, the best of YA, the best of fiction, the best of non-fiction, the best of all the other stuff that falls into a category, travel, biography, etc. Um, and that makes it a lot easier for you to pick and choose um, as you're going through. Obviously if the series too, they need to be connected um, because as we well know, especially with junior readers, series is very important. So particularly for e-platform, the Windows 8 app was actually released this month. Um, iOS and Android platforms continue to be being refined. If you haven't downloaded your copy of that, um, do do it perhaps straight after this um, presentation. Open up your screen, download the app. You'll find if you're a public library user, you'll just type in at the very top of the screen your local public library to see if they're a customer and you'll be able to borrow it immediately. Occasionally uh, if you can, we talked earlier about on, offline caching, so students and patrons can read more ebooks offline. Um, so they don't have to be, there's no, no need for Wi-Fi or broadband. If they're sitting on the bus, they can continue to read quite comfortably. In the UK, the Accelerated Reader Program is supported. Um, in fact, it's supported right around the world, but we're mentioning that specifically for UK listeners. Um, standing orders are available to assist in your selection process. And as I mentioned before, strong emphasis in finding and offering local publishing. I'm not sure that it's something that um, I want to be known as um, on my edge of epitaph, but um, at ALS we were amongst the very first Australian suppliers to find um, Amanda Hocking's titles before she was even picked up by a large publisher um, to create her titles. We were taking them um, off her small website and making sure that our, our libraries could read them because there was such, uh, already there was a small buzz that had been created um, by her. And of course, promotional material. There's no point in having a wonderful collection unless you've actually got patrons who are grabbing those collections and making use of them. All the things that you can see on the screen in front of you are downloadable um, from the ePlatform site. Um, you can personalise them, you can add your own logos to them. Um, uh, one, a New South Wales library recently contacted me and if you can see in the top left hand corner there the picture of the 
lady with the unwind picture. Um, they wanted, they were doing a bit of a, a local theme on um, with palm trees in the library and sand that they brought in, and uh, and this is a an, a library in the eastern state, so it's starting to be autumn and pretty chilly, and they wanted this whole concept. So we actually produced that on a small A5 card for them, which they which we personalised on the back and they gave it to every patron who came in the door over a two-week period. It was just a really nice connection point, and it is really as simple as one, two, three to download the book. So they were, they were able to increase um, not only their borrowings, but also to sign up a couple of people who'd been a little bit nervous about jumping into e-books. Um, and I think that's almost done us. So I'm just going to have a quick look to see whether there are any other questions. I can see two that we probably haven't touched on, so I'll very briefly mention those. The first one is about reporting. Um, uh, the question is how much reporting is available um, for our collections, and the answer is almost as much as you want. Um, there's very straightforward reporting which is based on user per title and also on the types of titles, um, and they can be in um, Excel format or in graph, graphic format. Um, so if you're trying to convince a um, board or a, a board of management or your local school council that the um, e-book borrowing has been effective, then you can download those. If you've got some very specific report requirements, um, the simplest thing to do is to contact us and say, I'd like this bit divided by this bit and I really want it looking like this and I'm sure we can assist you. But all the reporting is in the admin screen and it's available to you as a library manager. And the other question I've got here um, relates a little bit to what we, we did talk about earlier, and that is um, a setup fee versus a subscription fee. The question's been asked, what's the difference between two providers? One is charging me an annual fee and someone else is just charging me a one-off fee. It's a little bit hard for me to answer. I can only say that at ePlatform we charge a one-off setup fee. Um, again, um, we're, we talk about wanting you to build your collection, so we'd rather you were buying books. Um, and at this stage, that's how we're going to continue to do so. We don't have any annualised fees because once you're set up, everything works pretty smoothly. Um, so I don't think there's any need for that. And I think that's about all. I can't see any other questions popping up on my screen. So... I'm just going to press the last button to say thank you very much for listening. It's been very strange for me not to be able to see you. I hope that you've got something out of it. There is an email connect point there for you, a phone number, and also the eplatform.co website for you to have a bit of a sticky beak and to register your interest. I hope that we've been helpful for you, and um, I welcome any feedback. We will stay on the line for another few minutes. If anybody does have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Tricia. Um, there was a lot of information, certainly a lot of activity with questions coming in, and Andy has been extremely busy answering a number of those. Many of them are technical. There are some other questions that have come in. I'm not sure, Tricia, whether you can open up your question panel and see those. Uh, they probably okay. will appear as blanks against where Andy has um, has been looking at. But I mean, one question coming from a user is uh, they haven't quite yet started with e-books and they're asking a question about how do you go, where do you start? Oh, <laughs> that is a good question. Um, the first thing you need to do is to decide that uh, you want to do it. Um, and that might mean that you need to talk to either a school council or someone else who's going to fund that process. You need to also decide how much money you're going to spend. I know it seems a little strange to work backwards like that, but a budget, um, so you need intent and you need budget. Then what you need to do is to go and look at the various providers um, that are in the marketplace. I would suggest that you go to no more than three because I think if you go to too many, it just becomes confusing. Um, talk to some other members of staff or talk to other librarians or talk to your network and find out um, which providers they're using, get some recommendations, go to the websites and um, log on, have a really good sticky beak around. If you can get a trial subscription, 
to let you uh, envelop and um, work some things out. That's a very good start. After that, then it's usually a question of signing a contract. Um, and there are very few uh, clauses in the contract that are deal breakers. When you look at the contract the first time, you'll think, oh gosh, you know, nine pages of fine print. Do I really need to go through this? Unfortunately, yes, you do. Um, and the reason that you need to do that is because um, publishers are still extremely paranoid about uh, providing you with their very precious content. So you need to, the, pretty much what the contract says is, I, Library X, am going to purchase your books. I'm going to provide them for my students, one book, one reader, or my patrons, one book, one reader, or in some particular cases, um, in different quantities. And I promise faithfully to look after your copyright content. I won't resell it to anybody else. I won't send it out to the great marketplace in the sky. And I will ensure that it is maintained. So that's pretty much what the contract says. And you have to agree to do that um, and uh, with whoever your provider is. Once they've got the contract signed, um, it's a question of making the IT work, which is usually about setting up a link between your library management system or your website, your school website, and in Wheeler's case with the e-platform. You can personalise that by putting up a logo and making it look pretty. You can put a link into the front of the website um, and presumably you've already thought through the process of how your students or patrons are going to access those books. Um, and so there is either a password or um, their existing password, which will be in a database, which can be the link. And then it's just a question of buying the books. You can grab a standing order. Um, you can um, ask us to help you select. You can say, look, I've really only got $500 to spend. Pick me the best 500 that's going to get my readers excited to start with, and then maybe we can look further down the track. And we're very happy to do that for you. I think that's the answer. Good question. Okay, well, since we've still got about three minutes left, uh, another question we've got <laughs> is, uh, we're working you hard here, Tricia. Um, That's okay. <laughs> is, have you any advice or research evidence on the recommended size of a school's e-book collection when they begin to promote the books in this format? That is a good question. If we said that the average price of a book um, is about $20, now, a lot of books will come in under that. Um, if, if you're a library that's going to be buying a lot of cheap and cheerful Mills and Boone, they're only going to be um, seven, eight, ten dollars. If you're going to be buying a lot of high-end um, technical books, uh, they're going to be thirty-five to forty dollars. So I usually say rule of thumb, twenty bucks um, per book. And you've usually got around about a dollar or two dollar DRM fee, which is the digital rights management fee that publishers require. Um, to keep those books um, pristine and protected when they're in lending mode. So if you want to use that as um, a basis, you know, a hundred books is going to cost you $2,000, but you might get away with 50 books to start with uh, for around about $1,000, which would get your um, collection up and going. I think that you'd want to look at somewhere between 100 and 200 to begin with so that people get a broad range. If you're very concerned about a budget and you want to just trial it to see, I'd suggest that you only make it available to, um, if you're in a school, to a number of classes. Just make it available to, say, a two-year levels or even one-year level to begin with. Get them to trial it. Put the books in that you know are going to appeal specifically to that group and get the whole process going and running smoothly before you try to broaden it out and have it accessible to the whole school because um, otherwise it's going to be um, much more difficult to actually pick the collection to choose that uh, just to, um, to suit an entire range of, of ages. I think that's, um, that's a good way to start. So I haven't really answered the question. Um, it's just, I go, uh, spend as much money as you can. The money spent on books is never a bad thing, really. Do it. Okay, thank you. Um, we're pretty well at the top of our hour, so I'll just do some uh, closing off here. 
If you have submitted a question and it hasn't been answered at this point, that information too will be going to ePlatform folk and they will follow up with you to make sure that you get the information that you need in response to your question. So thank you very much, uh, Tricia, for being with us today and giving us so much valuable information and also too to Andy for being there in the background and answering questions through the uh, question panel. And thank everybody too for coming and joining us and I'm sure that you've picked up some key information that will help you as you venture further down this path with the ebook e club publishing and also uh, the, with the platform that you will choose for your school or the platform that you have and how you will use the features of that. So thanks very much folks and we'll uh, respond to your needs and questions uh, later on once the broadcast is over.